Hello everyone, welcome back to another video and this is the big one, the one we've been waiting for. We're going to go through the 2023 English SATs paper for year six or key stage two. Now there's been a lot of controversy around this paper and the difficulty, so the government have released it early today, the 18th of May, and I'm going through it right away. So I spent all morning snipping in the questions, snipping in the text, snipping in the evidence, and we're going to go through every single question because I've gone through this mark scheme with a fine comb. Okay, I think that's the saying. <laughs> I've gone through it really carefully, basically, and I've got it here for you guys because I know you wanted to see it. So I think we should just dive straight in. Very quickly, just a quick summary of what happens in the test. So you're given two booklets. One is the reading booklet you can see here, and it has the three texts on the front, three different texts inside, often different genres. And then we have the actual booklet itself where all the questions are and where you write your answers. That's why it's known as the answer booklet. A few facts. There are three texts, over 2,000 words. So if you think about a word per minute of 100 to 120, it's going to take you about 20 minutes just to read the actual text just to read the stories and the, and the texts that are involved, whether they're fact files or poems or whatever they are, 20 minutes of just reading. Then you've got to actually read the questions in the booklet, and then you've got to go back to the text and find evidence. So this timer of one hour, you can see at the bottom, is pretty tight if you ask me, because you've got 38 questions to answer. A bunch of them are either two or three marks. That's why we end up with a score out of 50. It is just really, really, really tight. And especially when we see this year the fallout from how difficult a lot of teachers thought the test was. Now, I've spoken to a lot of year six teachers and they do say that when they are on the day seeing the test, they thought, wow, this is tricky. And one of them actually did it. And the teacher themselves took over 40 minutes to answer the paper. Now that's a teacher, a qualified teacher who helps children. So this was not a very easy timer at all, but let's dive straight in. So. Question one, the first text, you can always see it down in the corner. This is a noise in the night. By the way, in the description, I've got links to these. They're in the public domain. They're on the government website. You can take a look and see exactly how tricky this paper was. Look at the first paragraph. How can you tell Priya was feeling nervous? Write two ways. And you've seen, I've, I've also included every time how many marks the questions were, because I think that is quite important. We have two marks here, and there are a bunch of different ways you can get two marks. So just because there are two marks doesn't mean there are only two answers sometimes. There are multiple ways to tell. And this is what we've got to do. Go to the text and find some evidence. So you could get a mark for saying that she woke with a start. That means she woke up quickly because she's been shocked by something. If you just said she woke up, that's not enough. Woke with a start would get you a mark. Heart beating fast, that would get you a mark. She took a deep breath and tried to calm herself. That's evidence to show that she's nervous. And here she's reassuring herself. It's nothing, she told herself strictly. Any four of those, so any of those four rather, if you write two of them in this box, you'll get two marks for that question. So this is just basic uh, working out here from reading the text, finding evidence. Why is she feeling nervous? Question two, look at page four. Why did Priya find it surprising to hear two vehicles drive by? Now, again, you need to always go back to the text. You cannot just think, well, why would I find it surprising? Maybe because it was, it was nighttime. Yeah, it was nighttime. No, look at the bottom. Do not accept reference to it only being late at night. Even if you read the story and you remember, well, it's nighttime, not many cars go past at night. Uh, I guess that's the answer. No. You have to be specific. You have to go to the text and find out why it was surprising in detail. So again, you have to find where the evidence is. They only they had only seen a couple of cars all day. So that is why it's surprising that they found one at night. You'd expect it to get quieter during night. And from the text, we can see during the day it was quiet. So again, in the mark scheme, to get a mark here, you've got a couple of options. Priya not seeing or hearing many cars, or you explain that there was a lack of traffic during the day. They're both different ways of saying the same point, but this is our evidence. And this is why those points will get you a mark. What I've done is as well, you can see at the bottom, do not accept. That's because I've actually snipped in from the mark scheme specific things they say not to accept because they are often trick answers. So you can see where the tricks are in this test. You've got another one here for question three. What made Priya realize that one of the vehicles was not a car? So we go to the text again, you have to find out, okay, am I looking for a keyword here, car maybe? I'm looking back to think, well, I've read the text, when do I remember her realizing something wasn't a car? And you find some evidence right here highlighted. Although now she thought about it, 
One of them must have been a truck or a tractor because its engine had sounded much too deep for a car. We've even got the word because here. It spells it out for us. What made Priya realize that one of the vehicles was not a car? Well, it was the actual deepness of the sound. Again, a couple of things you could put, the different engine sound, the different sound quality, or the sound of the engine with comparison to a car engine. So something to do with the sound, but look at the bottom. Do not accept anything about it being louder, okay? That is not taking the evidence from the text. It may have been a loud noise, but the direct reason is because it had sounded much too deep for a car. You have to go to the text, guys. That's how you're gonna make sure that you get a mark every time. So you could have put the different sound, the different sound quality. So something to do with the sound. You're gonna have to put some detail in there and use the evidence. Question four, look at the paragraph beginning the sound died away to the paragraph ending the other side of the valley. So it's telling you exactly where to look in the text. A mixture of questions will do this. Some will not tell you where to look at all. Some will tell you a specific paragraph. Some will tell you a specific line. And in this case, it's three paragraphs. And this is an ordering question. So number the following locations, one to four, to show the order in which Priya thought she heard the vehicles travel. Now, you know this information has to span across these three paragraphs because it's literally told you so. So you need to go in there and find some evidence, which I have done. Look here, the first bit of evidence is in the first paragraph. You may have gone straight to the third paragraph and thought, look, there's loads of different evidence here, reaching the foot of the hill, crossing the bridge, uh, the cattle grid, that's three of the four. But you have to be really careful because it's said to go from this top paragraph. So look, past the campsite comes first. So number one, past the campsite. Number two, the foot of the hill. Number three, crossing the bridge. And then finally going past the cattle grid. A common theme here, guys, you have to go to the text. You have to find your working out and your evidence from the text itself. And if it says to look across three paragraphs, well, guess what? The evidence is going to be across those paragraphs. There wasn't any in paragraph two, but that's fine. That still makes sense because when the first one came in the top paragraph and the last one came in the bottom paragraph, it can be anywhere in between. Question five, look at page four. So this is giving you a whole page, something like I was saying earlier, sometimes a paragraph, a line, this is giving you an entire page. What made Priya decide to take a look outside of the tent? Tick one. Now I don't need to tell you guys, but I'm gonna make the point really quickly that if it says tick one, if you tick two, guess what? <laughs> you don't get a mark. Again, look for evidence, okay? This is on page four. Quite suddenly, it stopped. Now this is our evidence we're looking for. So you may have actually skimmed past that at first because you didn't know that's what the answer was. And you get to this, whatever it was, she was going to take a look. Now, if you're skimming and scanning a text and you think, okay, look, she takes a look. She took a look here. Now I need to find out why, what made her do that? What made her want to take a look? This is a key bit of information. You have to look behind the key part of the text. So we found out here when she decides to take a look, but we can't just keep reading on because we'll miss the evidence. Sometimes you have to look before what you've scanned for in the text. And here we can see quite suddenly it stopped. Priya wondered about that. It was playing on her mind. And so she decided to take a look. So the answer to this one is she heard the engine stop. That's what triggered her uh, desire to actually check what was outside. Question six. Still on the same text here, guys. Look at the last paragraph on page four. Again, it's telling you exactly where to go. And this is the last paragraph. How can you tell that the moonlight was very bright? Now, again, I'm gonna show you the evidence first. And this, these are the two ways you can get a mark, okay? Number one, Priya being able to see the whole valley. So she could see the whole valley. Uh, that's going to get you a mark. And the reason is because there is evidence for that. Right here, she realized she could see the whole valley. Very odd at nighttime, isn't it, to be able to see the whole valley? You're making an inference there to say, okay, it's because of the moonlight. So again, that's going to give you uh, one mark. Another one is to say the valley everywhere being silver in the moonlight. And this is a specific reference here, silver in the moonlight. Now you have to be really careful though, talking about color, because look at this pesky little do not accept reference here. And this is one of the first tricks I don't quite like. Do not accept reference only to the three colors blue, black, and silver. Because if you look before silver, it says that the value was blue, black, and silver in the moonlight. So if you wrote down blue, black, and silver in the moonlight, you will not get a mark. But if you'd put silver in the moonlight, you would get a mark by saying the valley was silver in the moonlight. So just by adding in that extra information, you're showing the test markers. They think, oh, I don't think they quite understand. 
it has to be explicitly silver i thought that was a bit harsh a bit mean there's a few more questions like that in this test i must tell you question seven then it hit her rustlers it had to be now that's the part of the text that's going to be important here i thought this was a really horrible question a really tricky question look at the top of page five and that's what i've copied in here then it hit her what is it now when we think of it we think of an object a thing and here's the problem with this question and why it's tricky we are not thinking of a physical thing here this is a very abstract concept it hit her is a thought a realization so if you were to put a thought you would get a mark and that's just a fact now here's the trick as well then it hit her rustlers now we work out from the text that rustlers are thieves they're there to try and steal the sheep but it's very common here to put well what is well, it well the next thing that's mentioned are, are rustlers but we just have to think about it and go deeper and it requires like a very mature level of thinking that rustlers don't actually hit her what is it that is hitting her and it is a thought so there are a number of ways you can get a mark here again a realization that there are rustlers she figured out that there are rustlers she knew that they were going to be coming along and stealing so you can mention rustlers in your answer but just putting rustlers no you have to put a realization that they are rustlers so this is the important thing a thought a realization an understanding very abstract very tricky question I don't like it too much, but it's really testing high level understanding there of comprehension. Not a nice question. Question eight, another one. Again, I can really see where people are coming from thinking that this was a tricky paper. She wriggled back inside the tent. Now we teach children all the time to think about the context of a story. She's just snuck out of her tent, put her head out and she's seen some rustlers, some thieves. She's obviously very nervous. What does it tell you about how Priya got back inside the tent? She ran quickly inside. Well, she could run quickly inside if you're feeling nervous that's a very common thing to do isn't it to run back somewhere if you're feeling nervous and anxious but that's not what wriggled means we have to really narrow our focus here which is tricky in a test situation in the middle of 38 questions on a tight timer but this is not appropriate because it's got nothing to do with running back inside we have to look wriggled back inside her tent is the exact wording we have to go for she jumped through the flap again wriggling does not mean jumping it's just absolutely not true so we can start using deduction here to say it's not the first two she had to squeeze in and she crept in quietly i think this is where a lot of children will have an option and a 50 50 and they're quite struggling to pick which one's which you've got to think about the context just seen some thieves across the night if you wriggle you're moving slowly no one really wriggles back in very quickly they might do, but in your head, when lots of children think of wriggling, they think of just backwards and forwards, wriggling, not making much progress. So again, she would be quiet. She would creep perhaps. No, the answer here is squeeze in. And the idea is that wriggle does directly mean to squeeze into something. If you're wriggling into a jumper or trying to get into somewhere tight, you wriggle in, you maneuver yourself. The answer is clearly she had to squeeze in, but for a test in test conditions to leave that as an option, I think that's quite a tricky question as well so we are seeing why there was a bit of an uproar i guess let's keep going question nine you'd better not be making it up why does abby say this to priya now this involves you looking back to where abby actually says this and it's actually right at the bottom of what i've copied in but look how much before that that i've snipped into the smart because you have to go back in the text you have to go back read the whole uh, the whole context of the story and here it's the whole conversation okay so you better not be making it up why does abby say you better not be making it up again a few ways to get a mark for this it is one mark uh, and here's some evidence in the text abby groaned it's the middle of the night i'm asleep so anything that references abby being asleep so abby had been asleep you could put that there you'd get a mark uh, there are a few other ways that you could put it but they're all quite similar uh, so Abby had uh, Abby Abby who's Abby Abby had been asleep that's the number one answer you could say it's late at night early in the morning so you could reference that you better not be making it up because it's the middle of the night and also the mark schemes allows you to say Abby thinking it was a prank because you could put there that Abby wasn't sure whether she was telling the truth or not she might think that it's a prank so using that as our inference there to work out why she might be saying to Priya this better be real so more of a standard question there really question 10 look at page five write one piece of evidence that shows abby was shocked by what she, why by what she saw try and say seashore seashore she saw you're going to get it muddled up 
So why was she shocked by what she... <laughs> I keep got to... This is like she sells seashells by the seashore, but you weren't expecting to see this in your walkthrough. Why was she shocked? <laughs> well, here's some evidence here, guys. You can see it. If we go back to the story, we can find it. The sharp intake of breath, that's evidence that she's shocked. So if you put that, you'd get a mark. Another option, uh, the quotation about they have to do something. Okay, so she's shocked. The quotation, we have to do something. If she knows we have to do something, the mark scheme is allowing you to put that as evidence that she was shocked by it because she wants to go and find help and take action. So either of those would get you a mark for this one. Question 11. Look at the end of the extract. Why was Abby worried? Why was Abby worried? Now, again, going straight from the mark scheme. Uh, the number one is that she notices that the steals are being, uh, the sheeps are being stolen. Why am I getting my words bothered up? The sheep are being stolen. So that's number one. You could put the sheep are being stolen. That'll get you a mark. And we got evidence of that through what Priya saw and then through her grabbing the binoculars off Priya and looking for herself. So we know that the sheep are being stolen. That would get you a mark straight away. It would also accept Abby not knowing what they should do because she says we should do something, but she's very vague. So the test allows you to realize that she doesn't have an exact plan. She's quite worried. She doesn't know what to do. Ah, we need to do something. But she doesn't quite know what to do. It would get you a mark as well. Do not accept reference to that those are Mr. Jones's sheep. We have to do something. So if you just say this, that's not enough. That's not enough on its own. So I just said we have to do something can be used, but it has to be used in conjunction with. Therefore, this means she doesn't know what to do. It's vague. It's not exact. She's clearly shocked. We have to do something, but she doesn't know what to do. So she's worried about it. We've got to do something. Uh, so yeah, but what? That's, that's, the, that's the problem there. It's quite vague. Question 12. Now this one, if I remember correctly, is the last one from this text now. And this is a very common question type in the SATS paper. True or false chart. And you've just got to go through the entire text at this point and pick out true or false statements. And they're always usually tricks as well. So here are the pieces of evidence that I've taken from the text. It would be your job in the real thing, I guess, to go through and be like, right, I've got the whole text now. The first one here at the beginning of the story. Cool, I can go to the beginning. The binoculars belong to prayer. Cool, skim and scan for the word binoculars. Read that whole paragraph. So that idea of finding where in the text is a really key part of saving uh, time. At the beginning of the story, Priya uh, knew what had woken her up. This is false. Uh, something had disturbed her, but she wasn't sure what, so she didn't know. The binoculars belong to Priya. This is also false. Priya looked at her watch and asked, have you got your binoculars to Abby? So the, Abby's, um, so the binoculars belong to Abby. Both Priya and Abby agreed that they had to do something. That is true. Priya says we have to do something. And then right at the end, like we just discussed, Abby says we have to do something. So that is absolutely true. It's literally written there in the text. And finally, the rust has stopped in Priya and Abby's campsite. This is false. And the trick here is that it was directly opposite that they stopped. But also earlier in the text, it says that they, she heard them driving past the campsite. So them driving and the campsite is mentioned together, but nothing about them stopping. The only time we see the rust of stop is opposite on the far side of the valley. So false, false, true, false. Some tricks hidden in there that I'm sure you can see. Now, the next one. So we've gone there from kind of a narrative, a story, and now we're going into a non-fiction text. So this is all about bats. It's called Bats Under the Bridge. And again, like I said, in the description down below, you can get the full details, but let's dive straight in. Look at the first two paragraphs. That's what I've copied in here. In which American state is the Congress Avenue Bridge found? This caused uproar online. And I half get it and I half think, well, it does tell you. But I understand it for 10 and 11 year olds in a test. It's really tricky. It starts off with this at the bottom. Do not accept Austin. So you have to be really clear that Texas is the state. Now, we live in England. We're not exactly going to have the best knowledge of the different states in Texas, in, in the U.S., but if we look here, it says that Austin is a city. Now, again, you might think, is it a city, a state? I'm not too sure. But then if you keep reading, guys, look at this part. Austin is the capital city of the state of Texas. So it's a really harsh question in that some previous knowledge might hinder or lack of previous knowledge might hinder your ability to compute that. And you might think, oh, I should just know this. I've, I've heard of Texas before. Austin's a city. I've seen Austin there with a capital letter. It's clearly a place. But to get it exact as a state, you have to read on, and it is written right there, state of Texas. But in the high octane uh, arena of the test, guys, where it's really, really focusing and getting some tricky stuff through, I thought that was a bit of a harsh question myself. Question 14. 
Look at the first two paragraphs. Why is Batfest held in the summer? Why is Batfest held in the summer? Again, I've looked in here. This is the key bit of information. Every evening in summer, they all come swarming out at once. So if we're thinking about why Batfest would be held in the summer. That's one of the reasons. Summer is when the bats come out. So that's going to give you a mark if you write down summer is when the bats come out. Now, you might be looking at the bottom and seeing what they do not accept. And they do not accept reference to it being warm. So summer is when the bats come out. That would get you a mark. Summer is when the bats are beneath the bridge. That would get you a mark. Or summer is when there are lots of bats. Anything directly referencing why summer is specifically a good time. Lots of bats. They're all under the bridge. They all come out. Do not accept anything about it being warm. It is not a reason why it's held in the summer. If it was if it was cold and the bats came out, that's when they would hold, hold the event still because we're here to see bats. We're not here to have a good sunbathe and be warm. We're here to see the spectacle of bats. So you have to be really specific there with that answer. Question 15. The bridge is described as a hotspot by the interviewer and by Harriet. What does the word hotspot mean when the interviewer uses it in her question? Well, look, let's look at the question. Let's look at this question. This ordinary bridge is popular with bats. What makes it such a hotspot? It's directly referencing what she's just said in the sentence before. So again, it says here, uses it in her question. Go and look at her question. It's going to give you the answer. Now, the reason uh, why this one, uh, the, sorry, the answer to this question is that it's popular with the bats. So if you just put popular, no, that's not going to get you a mark. You have to reference that it's popular with bats the bridge is a popular place with bats it's a hot spot for bats that's where all of the bats go okay so if you just say a popular place adding in that bit of extra detail there the mark scheme might be kind to you and give you a mark but you have to directly think about what it's popular with because look at the bottom if you say it's popular with people that is not going to get you a mark so if you go into more detail and start saying, well, it's an attraction. Lots of people go to the bridge. Lots of people go there. No, you have to reference the fact we're talking about bats. And you can see here in the question we're talking about bats. That's what's going to get you the mark there. Now, this is the second part of the question. What does the word hotspot mean when Harriet uses it in her answer? So the interviewer means it's very popular with bats. But Harriet kind of jumps on this and says, ah, it's funny you should say this and look at this. It's actually very appropriate that you call it a hotspot. Then she goes on to explain how the building of the bridge itself is actually perfect, the right width to trap warmth nicely because bats need warmth, especially baby bats. When they're born hairless, only have a few months to develop, they need warmth. So she's saying, well, funny you should say hotspot because it's actually really warm in there. So anything here, uh, referencing the warmth uh, for the pups, for the young bats. Okay, pups are the name for young bats here. So a place that's hot, under the bridge is very warm. It literally means a spot that is hot. Uh, it means a hot temperature, anything to do with warmth there. Do not accept reference to the bridge being an ideal place for bats to raise their young without reference to warmth. So you can see the really important part here is you're making a link between hot spot and warmth that's what's getting you the mark in this question making that link there question 16 look at harriet's answer to the question the same one that we just looked at this ordinary bridge is popular bats what makes it a hot spot the congress avenue bridge attracts bats to austin what else attracts bats to austin this one is rather straightforward it's just a paradise because it's of all the tasty insects. This is just a retrieval question. So anything here to do with the number of insects. So uh, tasty insects would give, get you a mark. Lots of insects would get you a mark. Anything to do with this sentence right here should be quite a straightforward mark for you guys to pick up. Question 17. This one caused controversy as well. So let's take a look. Look at Harriet's answer beginning. It's actually very appropriate, blah, 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 blah. This is her answer here. We know it's answer because it says A, and here it says it's actually very appropriate. Find and copy one word that is closest in meaning to eat. This is the most common SAT question I ever see. Find and copy one word that is closest in meaning to eat. The reason why this caused a bit of controversy is because there are two options. <laughs> so it even says it in the mark scheme. Consume means to eat. So you can put consume, but if you kept reading to make sure you could have seen feeding and then you might have been confused and put, well, feeding also means to eat. And if you put two answers, 
you're not going to get a mark. It says find and copy one word. It's testing your reading. And I thought this was incredibly harsh. There's, only, there's two possible answers. I guess some people might say, well, there's two chances to get the mark right. But this could just add confusion. Like I keep saying, we need to remember the context of these 10 and 11 year olds sat in a test, stressed, trying to achieve their best. Anything like this can just throw them off. I thought it was slightly harsh. Uh, but either of those will get a mark if you just put one of them. Question 18, look at Harriet's answer to the question, have there always been so many bats here? So it's telling you quite often in this section exactly where to look, which is very useful. So do use that. Again, find and copy one word, which means a group of bats living together. Guess what? There were two options for this as well. A colony is a group. So you can see here, many have campaigned to have the bat colony eradicated. If you're not sure, you can read the word in context. And if you didn't know what colony meant, we could be thinking, well, what could I swap colony with? But guess what? Further down the page, there's also a mention of population. So the mark scheme says, award one mark for colony. That'll get you a mark. But if you write population, they'd also accept that as well. Again, you have to write one. Find and copy one word it's really really important question 19 look at harriet's answer to the question have there always been so many bats here according to harriet why did some people in austin dislike bats now if you read through she gives a number of reasons towards the end of hers which i've snipped in here and we can see the exact quotes and evidence and notice what i'm doing constantly going back to the text constantly finding evidence it's really really important to do that they were seen as uninvited guests okay clearly that's important um, that's going to be one of the answers there. Uh, another one, so you could put they were been uninvited. Uh, another one is that people thought that they would carry disease. We can see that here. Uh, thought they carried disease. Uh, and there's a third one. Now, do you need to put the third one? No. You could just put these two and you could get the mark. But notice, give two reasons and it's for one mark. So if you write just one reason, you're not getting a mark. The other one here, you can see, uh, thought they'd attack us. So any two of these three, people uh, thought the bats would attack and pull their hair. People thought the cats, uh, the bats carried disease and the bats were uninvited. It also says, uh, except a sudden increase of numbers. So all of a sudden there were lots, they will give you that as well. Do not accept anything to do with the bats appearance. Now it might be given to you that they have teeth and claws or that they're frightening, but this is the exact piece of evidence from the text. This is the interviewer saying exactly why people were worried. You have to use these as your evidence. That's the only way you're going to get a mark. Question 20, look at Harriet's answer to the question, there are millions of bats in Texas. How can they need, sorry, how can they need protecting? So there's so many of them, it's a good question. If there's so many bats, they're not obviously not endangered, why are they in such a tricky place? Anyway, the question, kind of goes off on a tangent. Harriet describes the bats as vulnerable. Which of these is closest in meaning to vulnerable? Now again, you need to, uh, if you're not sure, you can swap in these words. So you can say foolish. You could put foolish into the text and say, well, does that quite make sense? I don't think ever that the bats are described as foolish, so we can use deduction. Uh, frightening, they are described as frightening, but we're talking about protecting the bats. So if they're vulnerable, and the idea is that being vulnerable links to protecting them, I don't think frightening works or tormented. The best one here is at risk. So you might know what vulnerable means, but you can use deduction. You can go back to the text, swap in answers to get the right answer in the end and at least have a best guess. Now, this is the next part. Why does living in large groups, which is what the question was getting at, make bats vulnerable? So the interviewer is saying, well, there's so many of them. Surely that's a reason why they're not vulnerable. Harriet actually replies and says, look, this is why. So here's the text up there and there's the evidence. But they are vulnerable because they live in large groups. So again, we could put that, but we're gonna need some more detail. Why does living in large groups make them vulnerable? Well, keep reading. One cave alone has 15 million bats living in it. Imagine if anything happened to that cave. 15 million bats would all become homeless at once. So to get a mark here, you could mention one of two things from the, uh, the mark scheme. Many bats being affected if their habitat is damaged. So many bats are affected if one thing happens. So if habitat damaged, that's going to be a really vital point. And something I never considered before. If habitat damaged, actually there are so many millions living in one place. Imagine a huge city like London, like nearly 10 million people living in London. If something happened to London, oh my goodness, 
that would be catastrophic. It doesn't matter that there's loads in there. In fact, that can be a negative. It also says here, many bats being affected if something happens. So these kind of link in. So that's what you've got to get at. There's loads in one place. If something happens to that place, that habitat, it's going to be devastating. Something about them all dying at once. They could all get wiped out in one go. Anything about all of the bats being affected by one thing happening. That's going to get you the mark here. Really interesting as to what they do not accept. Do not accept reference to many bats being affected. Many of them wouldn't survive. Many of them would become homeless. We need to be really, really specific. Okay? We need to be really specific. This on its own wouldn't work. You'd have to add in what I just said about in one go. It's all about it happening quickly. If one thing happens to that place, it's going to affect them all. Quite a harsh mark scheme if you ask me. Uh, you, but you've just always got to be really specific, guys. That's how you're going to get it. You cannot just mention damage as well. The cave will be destroyed. Cool. You need that link, like we said. Many bats in one place. If one thing happens, they're all going to be affected. You have to put the entire thought train in, else you won't get a mark. Question 21. Look at Harriet's answer to the question, what benefits could bats possibly bring to humans? How can you tell Harriet thinks insects are pests? Now, the mark scheme gives four possible ways. Let's take a look at what we could put. Now, it's all at the top. She does go into some detail later, but here are the main bits. Number one, the negative effects on farming. So that would give you one of your points straight away. Negative on farming. And we can see there we've got evidence at the top. Farmers have to spend millions of dollars because... Uh, the um, the insects are eating away at their crops. Number two, insects annoying people. You can see here, who hasn't been tormented by mosquitoes or wops? Clearly, she thinks they're pests because she's saying people are affected. They're annoying people. Now, if you stopped here, guess what? You get two marks. But there are some other options. People might say, well, wouldn't I get a mark for this? The answer is yes. There are two more ways you get a mark. So one mark for each point here. And there's another mark that you could get for people having to fight against insects. So she uses the word battling against insects. That would get you a mark. And Harriet being positive about insects being eaten. So she says bats are allies by killing insects. You can see here, um, we should view bats as allies, not as enemies. And she's just explained how bats would be eating the insect. So any evidence from the text that supports her point of view, thinking that insects are a negative, are pests, are annoying, you're going to get the mark. It does say at the bottom here, do not accept reference to Harriet's negativity without giving specific examples. And this is what I wanted to show you here. Now, this is really interesting to me because these are all specific examples from the text. And we see here in the mark scheme, people being punished for not being specific. You cannot just say, she only descri uh, describes annoying things about them. That seems like a legitimate answer, doesn't it? How can you tell that she thinks insects are pests? She only says bad things. But you're not going to get a mark. You're not going to get a mark because it wants specific answers. And we've just gone through all four. You have to go to the text in this test. You have to go to the text in a reading test. It's as simple as that because you're going to need really specific answers. So question 22. Draw four lines to match the amount on the left to a factor on the right. This is just retrieval. But again, this is across the entire text. Classic question here where the question is quite easy, but there's so much information, so much skimming and scanning to do. Luckily for me, I can just look for it in the text by searching a word. For anyone taking the test, they have to scan and scan. This is going to eat up time. This is going to add to that time of pressure that the teachers were talking about in this paper. Really tricky. So we can see here thousands of visitors every year. So people visiting uh, the Congress Avenue Bridge, that's going to go across the top there. Uh, a few months, and we can see that here, a few months to develop for the baby bats. The next one here is 10 tons, 10 tons of insects eaten. You can see that here. Um, so that's, my goodness, that's a lot of insects. And finally, 15 million bats living in one cave, which was part of the information there. So not much to say about that one apart from a real timer eater. You can eat away your times there really really tricky uh question 23 still on bats under the bridge um we've got a few more questions to go look at page seven using information from the text tick one box in each row to show whether each statement is true or false another one like we've had earlier this is true or false retrieval questions again it's all in the text but they're going to try and trick you they're going to try and make you look across the whole paper so for the last two questions you could be scanning up and down up and down there's two sides 
of text really is going to make sure that timer just keeps dripping down and down and down. Uh, Harriet Lopez thinks some bats are cute. That's true. It says here, some are even cute. Uh, next one, bats could be an alternative to chemicals for farmers. That's true. She talks about how farmers spend millions on chemicals that can harm the environment, but then goes on to say how bats can do the same job. In Texas, there are more humans than bats. Again, it's true that bats are easily outnumber humans in Texas. So this is an interesting one because they've just flipped it. In Texas, there are more humans than bats. No, because it says here bats outnumber humans. So if you think about a chart, that's bats. Humans would be lower. So the statement there are more humans than bats is false. Classic trying to trick you there, just flipping it around and making you put false, double negative. Putting a bat box in your garden will encourage insects. No, it encourages bats to live there. And we can use what we've been told to say that actually if bats live there, insects will not thrive. So this is false. It does not encourage insects. It does the opposite. Question 24. Is there anything I can do to support bats in my area? This question shows that the interviewer did what? Now again, look at all the options. Is surprised there are so many bats in Austin? Is unsure what to think about bats? Has decided to attend Bat Fest the coming year? Agrees with Harriet Lopez's opinions on bats. Now we have to just tick one. That's important. Sometimes we tick two, sometimes we tick one. And here, look, we're all about evidence, okay? So think about it. Is surprised there are so many bats in Austin? There's no evidence to suggest that she's surprised. There's no evidence at all. And that doesn't mean, she's just because she's asking what she can do to support bats doesn't necessarily mean anything to do with that she's shocked by the number of them. Is unsure what to think of bats? Well, no, look, because she's directly asking, what can I do to support? So she clearly does know what she thinks. She thinks she wants to support them. So she's definitely sure and not unsure. Has decided to attend Bat Fest in the coming year. Absolutely no evidence of that at all. It's just that she could go. She might want to go, but there's no evidence that the question means that. So it's all about making those direct links. The answer is the bottom one here. She agrees with Harriet Lopez's opinions because she's asking now to support them. So she's interviewed Harriet Lopez. Harriet Lopez has been very passionate about how to help bats. And now the interviewer is saying, okay, well, what can I do to support? So that's showing that she agrees with Harriet Lopez's opinions. Question 25, deduction. I put a big word there. Deduction just means getting wrong, uh, rid of wrong answers. Tick two reasons why Harriet Lopez is a good person to interview about bats. So again, we could go through the whole text, absolutely, but this is a kind of a culmination of everything once we've read the text. She can explain why bats are dangerous. She definitely did not do that. She was doing the opposite. She was showing bats in a good light, saying they aren't too dangerous. They're not going to attack you. They're here to help. So it's definitely not the top one. She organizes Bat Fest. There is no evidence to suggest that. We mentioned Bat Fest in the first two, but then we go to Harriet Lopez for more information about bats. No evidence that she organizes Bat Fest. She knows important details about bats. That is absolutely true. We've just read two pages of her telling us all of these details. She campaigns against bats. Guys, a simple read. If just a one read through, you can tell me straight away. She definitely does not campaign against bats. And look what it says. Tick two. You have to really look out for this. And it's only for one mark. So if you stopped now, guess how many marks you'd get? Zero. Even though you got one right, you'd get zero. You have to tick the final box. She understands how people feel about bats. She literally spent a whole paragraph saying, I get it. I understand. People are scared. People were worried. But now people need to do this. So the answer there to those two was that. Question 26. This is the last one now. And you can see, can't you, by the length of this video, this is not an easy paper. Okay, children, you get one hour to answer this. Let's keep going. What positive messages does Harriet want readers to understand about bats? Give two positive messages using evidence from the text. Now, again, the answers aren't too important here because I'll flash them up on the screen in a minute. All the options, you can pause them and have a look. I just want to do this. How do I get three marks on this? Because it's the three mark question. Three marks if you make two acceptable points. Hayden made a brilliant video about this recently. Check it out on our page, how to ace the reading test. Uh, and this is, would have come in handy quite clearly. Three marks if you make two acceptable points. And even if you just do one piece of evidence, you can do another one to make sure we'd, we'd say do that. But even if you just make one bit of evidence, you could get three marks. You can get two marks by just using two acceptable points and no evidence. Or if you complete one point with one piece of evidence, that'll get you two marks as well. And you get one mark if you just put one acceptable point. So if you fill in just one quarter of this chart, you can still get one mark. Now I'm gonna show you on the screen all the different ways. The question is give two positive messages using evidence. So two positive, two positive messages about bats 
using evidence from the text. Here are all the options. So guys, take a pause, pause the video. If you've got it open because I put it in the link, then you can maybe find that. Bats provide benefits, bats are not harmful, bats should be protected, bats are our friends, bats are misunderstood. Look at all of these options. Look at all of this evidence, endless ways almost to get three marks. Really, Hayden was right when he said three mark questions. They're a, they're a really easy way to get three marks if you really understand how the question works. And hopefully this does help you. Let's move on to the final text. The final text is Howl at Dusk. Again, you can see it in the bottom right hand corner. This is a story about uh, someone who comes across a wolf. And we'll get into more detail as we go through. So question 27. After Innis, this is the boy who uh, comes across the wolf. Heard the wolf howl for the first time. He pressed on. What does pressed on mean in the text? Now, again, pressed has a different meaning, doesn't it? If you press something, you push it. That is not what's going on here. And what's important to do, if you find he pressed on in the text, you have to read backwards to notice that he had heard something beforehand. So the how pierced the dark sky and made Innis stop dead in his tracks. So you know from earlier, if you go back, that he's still. Then he pressed on. So that's what's going to give you the actual uh, detailed answer here of how to get the mark he pressed on means he walked he carried on he kept on walking so something about he kept on doing what he was doing in this case it was walking look at what they will not accept he walked quicker this is a really uh, horrible one because in the next paragraph it says he started to speed up so if you'd read the whole text and just gone back you might remember that and put it in no you have to go back to the text guys and find exact answers Question 28. How far from home was Innis when he heard the first wolf howl? You have to just go back to the text. This is retrieval. He was still a good half mile from home. So a half mile. That will get you a mark there for question 28. A half mile. Now you could include uh, a good in there. It's in brackets in the mark scheme, which means you could include that. Anything to do with a half mile. Do not accept vague, vague, non-specific references to distance it's harsh because you know he is quite away from home still but you have to be specific this test is training you to go to the text and find exactly what it says don't be vague he was quite a bit away from home that's not going to get you the mark you need to be exact question 29 the barons was the name for what well i found barons in the text now you're not expected to know what the barons are so look at this a snowy wooded area well snow is mentioned Snow is mentioned in this text multiple times. Sandy land on the coast, less so. A wet area of rough ground, fields of grass and crops. Well, we don't know this area. Innis knows this area, but we don't know this area. But look, you have to use the text. Bumpy and boggy. So using bumpy and boggy, it expects you then to work out boggy means wet and bumpy rough ground, up and down. So the answer here is a wet area of rough ground. It doesn't mean you have to know what barons is on your own. It doesn't mean no, you have to read on from the text and know what these words mean. Quite a tricky one, boggy. Would you think of wet when you think of boggy? Many people would. 10, 11 year olds, would you necessarily think that without being told before what boggy is? It's a tricky one, but the answer there is a wet area of rough ground. Question 30, look at page eight. We said this earlier. Sometimes it tells you exactly where to look. This time it's a whole page. So imagine that whole page in front of you. I've snipped in the relevant bits because I've already seen the answer. What two things made it hard for Innis to trust his own senses when he was looking for the wolf? Now, if we look at the options, how flat the land was, how, the fading light, how tired he felt, the weather, how fast he was walking. All of them you could kind of argue for if you didn't look at the text. But by diving into the text, look what we've got here. It's mentioned multiple times, the gloomy sky and the gathering snow peering through the snow and the gloom. He's, he's looking through the weather, the snow. It's getting dark, which what gloomy means. So we have to make the reference here again. It's word meaning. Gloom means dark. If something's gloomy, it's dark. And snow is obviously to do with weather. So those are the two points that the text is constantly making about how it's actually tricky for him to see what's going on. He's not sure that's what's affecting him. So the answer here is fading light and weather. They're the two things that the text through using different words that you have to work out is trying to show you how it's affecting his senses. Question 31, look at page eight. Again, you're in the whole of page eight. How can you tell that Innis was familiar with the area? This is a one mark question, but the mark scheme allows three or four things. So listen up for these ones here. And here are the actual highlighting that we can see. Innis 
knew this ground. So anything about Innes knowing the terrain, he knew every bump and every dip. He knew the ground. That'll get you a mark. Question uh, number two, his knowledge of the wildlife. So you could say that he knew there were no wolves on Nin. He knew that he knew when wolves were last seen there years and years ago. So something that references in knowing the wildlife. He knows the terrain. He knows the wildlife. And this is the last one. He knows exactly how far he is from home. So the fact he knows all these things shows he's familiar with the area. If you didn't know where you were, you'd have no idea about the wolves. You'd have no idea how far from home you were. And you'd have no idea about the bumps and the dips in the ground. So any three of them will get a mark. Also accept that he knew the way home. He knew where he was going. And it would also accept that he is not a stranger. He lives in the land. So lots and lots of ways to get a mark here. Again, just go to the text and pick one. It's one mark question. How can you tell? Just put one thing down. You're going to get the mark there. Question 32. Look at the paragraph beginning. The howl pierced the uh, darkening sky. And this was worried by the two wolves. Another thing here to the end of no wolves in nin this is like three four five small paragraphs there's a big chunk of text but you know exactly where to look Innis was worried by the two wolf howls write one piece of evidence that shows he was worried after the first wolf howl now if you go to the second question which we will in a minute it's asking you how do you know he was worried after the second wolf howl and this is testing you knowing the chronology of the story which chunk is after the first and which chunk is after the second so for the first wolf howl again you're gonna get a whole chunk of options here and you can see them all highlighted number one in is stopping in is stopped dead in his tracks that show one piece of evidence that he was worried you could put that get a mark number two in is speeding up he walked faster afterwards so he's anxious he's trying to hurry up number three his uh, the only thing that he could hear was his beating heart so his heart is thudding he can hear it himself number four in this was reassuring himself there are no wolves in nim that I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm i'm confident that show a sign that he's worried he's nervous because he's reassuring himself and finally the fact he was listening intently why what are you listening to that's showing again that he's nervous any of those five in this box and you'll get a mark next one Write one piece of evidence that shows he was worried after the second wolf howl. Now, there is a do not accept down the bottom. Do not accept that he hurried up. The text does say that he hurried up, but you might remember what I said just a minute ago. The reason why this is not going to be accepted is because he hurried up after the first cry, not after the second. So this is testing. You have read the question really carefully. Here are some options about the second one. It's described as blood curdling. In is stopped again. He caught his breath and he was he held it still. He turned full circle and he was scanning the landscape. So in this short amount of text, we've actually got five ways to get a mark. And in these question types, these are the ones where actually if we look at exactly where we're meant to look in the text. It should be quite easy for us to pick up a mark there. Any of those will get you a mark. Question 33. Here we go. Innis heard wolf howl several times. How can you tell that the wolf was moving all the time? One mark. So it's just one thing that tells us that. Now, this is really a, a really good question. And it's a trick question as well in that there is a do not accept down the bottom, which is quite tricky. So you cannot only reference the sound. So how can you tell the wolf was moving all the time? Uh, all, all the time Because of the sound. Because you could tell by the howls. Now, lots of children will be thinking the exact answer, but just put down because of the howls. And you can tell because of the different howls. No, to get a mark here, you have to mention or reference the distance. That is exactly what's telling us that it's moving. The sounds don't. You can't just say, oh, the sounds change. That's not enough. You have to reference the distance. And here's the evidence. The first one, closer this time. So this, uh, when, when they, sorry, the second how, closer than the first one. Then there was immediate response again, but from further away. So the distance of the uh, howls is telling us the wolf must be moving okay the wolf's further away the wolf's closer anything that references that will get you the mark and because of that you could also get a mark for referencing volume okay so anything about them getting closer and further away gets you a mark you could say the wolf's cry was louder and quieter each time you could reference that because that's still linked to distance you cannot just be vague you cannot just mention sound Okay? He could hear it because of the sound, because of the house. You've got to be really, really specific. Question 34. It was unmistakable silhouette of a wolf. Which of the following is closest in meaning to unmistakable? This is a word meaning question. You don't have to read the text for this. 
you just need to tell us which one of these is closest to unmistakable. Now, the clue here is to break it up into un and mistakable. So what does mistakable mean? If something's mistakable, you can make a mistake. The root word here is mistake. You can make a mistake. Oh, I'm not sure. I might get it wrong. So let's think about what the prefix un does to the word mistakable. If something's mistakable, you might get it right. If it's unmistakable, what's the opposite of you might get it right? You're definitely going to get it correct. So here is the key. You can look at the actual breakdown of the word and try to work it out. If something's unmistakable, it is definite. There's no way you're going to make a mistake. It's the opposite of mistakable. So oh, it's mistakable. It's quite vague. I, I can't really tell what that is. I mean, I'm quite unsure. The opposite of that, unmistakable. Oh my goodness, I know that is definitely a wolf. So the answer there is definite for that one. We're coming towards the end here, guys. Look at that timestamp. One hour to complete this test. I know I'm talking it through and going in detail, but doesn't it just show how tricky this test really was? Question 34, number the following events one to five uh, in order. This is just an ordering text. So in the order which they happen to Innis, this is testing you, summarizing almost and ordering the entire text and knowing exactly what happens each time. The first thing that happens, he heard an unexpected howl. Then he imitated the wolf howl because he called back to see if the wolf would call back to him. The next thing that happened was he then saw a wolf. Number four here, after he saw the wolf, he ran away. And then at the very end, he met a boy. Some children struggle with these questions because there are things that happen in between. So in between, he heard an unexpected wolf howl and he imitated a wolf. He's reassuring himself. He hears his heart beat. Okay, so there's lots that happens in between. But still, these five things, this is the order that they happen. It doesn't mean these are the only five things that have happened. It means that these are five things that have happened and we've just had to order them. There are three questions left, guys. Let's go. Let's try and make this video less than an hour, shall we? Because that would be quite ironic. Question 36. I've just copied the question, the, um, the possible answer straight in. So this is how you can get a mark here. It's two marks and there's also things not to accept. Let's dive in. Innes did not know the boy. Why else might Innes have been surprised to see the boy? Might Innes have been surprised? We're using inference here. We're trying to work out what, what could have been the reason using evidence in the text. Here are the three reasons. The remoteness, the difficult terrain. So the boy was in the middle of nowhere. At the middle of nowhere. He was far away from any human settlements. The landscape was desolate. All information we received earlier in the text, that could get us one of the two marks. The next option, the boy's sudden appearance and Innes thinking he'd been alone. The boy came out of nowhere. Innes thought he was alone. He arrived unexpectedly. The boy was not mentioned at all. When Innes was turning around and surveying the landscape, he didn't see any boy. So the boy coming out of nowhere, that might be one of the reasons why he was surprised. Again, we're still using evidence from the text. And the third reason, Innes was expecting to see a wolf and not expecting to see a boy. So when he looked up, he looked for a wolf, but he didn't see a wolf. Instead, he saw a boy. So he wasn't expecting to see a boy. He was there instead of the wolf. Uh, and, and basically anything to do with that kind of shock. The, the mark scheme does say also accept, and this isn't what you can't accept, this is what you can accept, sorry for earlier, reference to it getting dark. So again, the reason why the test is allowing this is because the text says it's getting dark. So because a child might have taken evidence of the text of the, sorry, from the text of it getting dark, they're going to reward you for using that evidence in your answer. So any two of these will get you two marks. You don't need all of them. You just need two of them, just like in previous questions. Question 37. The first words Innes said to the boy were, where are you going? Why did Innes want to know where the boy was going? And for us to work this out, we can see at the top here, where are you going? Well, that's going to be vital because then we're going to keep reading. That's going to be really important. Keep reading because he reveals afterwards. What's it to you? The boy asked about turning or stopping. There's a wolf out there. Look what Innes immediately wanted to say. His revealing, he is revealing here his reasons for asking where he's going. Think about what's just happened as well. He's literally running away from a wolf. Sees a random boy walking off. Where are you going? This is pure inference here. And we can actually tell from the continuation of the conversation exactly why he's asking. So here to get a mark, you need to reference any of the following. The presence of a wolf. And, and um, you could just say there's a wolf because there was a wolf somewhere out there. Why does he want to know where he's going? Because of the wolf, because Innes has seen a wolf, because he's literally trying to walk away from, the, uh, he's literally walking towards a wolf, the young boy. Number two, Innes is concerned about the boy's safety. He doesn't want him to get hurt. He wants to protect the boy. He wants to help keep him safe and not come across a dangerous wolf. Or you could just say he's trying to warn the boy. 
So you could say here, yep, Innis is trying to warn the boy because he wanted to tell him about the wolf, which we could see there by the next option. So again, three options there, three ways to get the mark. Concerned about safety of the boy, warning the boy, and the presence of a wolf. Any of those will get you a mark. So multiple ways to get the mark for sure. But still, oh, 37th question in one hour after this uh, test, which is going to take a lot of energy. It's tricky to keep going all the way to the end. And guess what? At the end, we have a three mark question. Now, I still do agree with Hayden that three mark questions we can, if we understand how they work here, which I'm going to point out again, uh, then we can get three marks more easily than it might seem. But still, finding all this evidence, gathering it, finding acceptable points, it's going to take a bit of time. So look at the paragraph beginning in a sat up to the end of the text. So that's another chunk of text. Innis meets the boy. What do you learn about the boy's personality? Give two things and use evidence. Now, you know already you can get three marks by giving two things, but only giving one piece of evidence. And what I'm going to do now is show you the possible answers on the screen. Now, you could put he's unfriendly and he is curious. If you put those two things down, you would get two marks straight away. No evidence at all. All you'd have to do is add in one bit of evidence here anything to do with him asking questions for being curious or anything here from the text unfriendly eyes what's it to you strode off about another word anything about him being rude so the key to these questions is you have to get your answer from the text you can't just make it up okay uh, the boy's personality oh I, I think actually maybe he was quite kind well where are you getting that from that is nowhere in the text to say he's kind at all so you have to find evidence in the text and then kind of summarize it yourself so two acceptable points and one bit of evidence gets you three marks. The most important thing I'd say to you in these three mark questions is just get two points down. That's going to get you two marks. So you could have just said he's mysterious and he's untalkative. That would get you two marks straight away. Easy way to get two out of three. And then if you have time, find evidence. But guys, guess what? That is the end of this reason, uh, reasoning of this English paper. And I think my summary here is we can really see why there was such a backlash. A really tricky text to pack loads in. I've been talking it through to you and this whole video is now close to an hour. An hour. Now, obviously I went into more detail, but imagine in the shoes of a 10 or 11 year old in an English test, working hard all year, been doing practice tests and then this one bumps up the difficulty. The time is quite tight. I really do understand guys, but guess what? We're gonna be back again next week. So make sure you press subscribe, make sure you like the video and send this to someone who you want to show how tricky this SATS paper was because you've had the full walkthrough. We'll be back next week when they release the maths papers. And if you want us to do the spelling, punctuation, and grammar, you're going to have to let us know down in the comments. Guys, thank you so much for watching this long. Whew, what a paper. See you next time.